Well, hey, folks, Brian here. Welcome back to Wax Trash Treasures. Nice to see you. Nice to be seen. Always great to be a part of your day. Uh, one of the cool things about starting to collect in the junk wax era, which is when I started collecting uh, in 1987, is that there were lots of different ways to get into the hobby, and all of them were pretty inexpensive. Uh, there were, you know, uh, individual wax packs. You could buy wax cases. You could buy uh, fat packs, which were 30 or 45 cards. Uh, they often had a special um, a, a special insert uh, card available within that set. Uh, there would be uh, rack packs, right? Those were definitely 45 cards. They often had a special insert in the set as well. But from 1957 to 1997, uh, Topps actually had a really cool way to get a huge number of cards and really get started on a base set pretty quickly, and that was this. This is a vending box. Sometimes they're called vendor boxes on eBay or on Facebook Marketplace or whatever it is that you shop. That's not right. It's a vending box because these are designed to go into vending machines. Topps produced vending machines, uh, card dealers, and by the 1970s, really, it was mostly antique shops. We drop a, a stack of these cards inside. You could pay five cents or ten cents or twenty-five cents and get a few cards out of the deal, right? Uh, what's in a vending box is entirely base cards, and so it's just no inserts, none of the high gloss all-star cards, none of the record breaker cards, just base. Uh, but what's very cool about them is that there's no gum stains because, of course, there was no gum put into these vending boxes, which means your odds of getting an unstained card are slightly, well, they're 100% better, right? Um, but the odds of getting a card in good shape are, generally speaking, a lot better, too. The cards moved around a lot less. They were better protected in this than they would be in a wax pack. Uh, you can buy vending boxes from every year, although, of course, in the highest volume, they're from the junk wax era, 1987 to 1994 or so. Uh, but uh, sometimes you might find a, uh, find one and you're like, oh, this deal is too good to be true. So I want to show off uh, how you can tell if a card, uh, if a vending box is actually still good, if it's unsearched the way that sellers promise that it is, uh, if it's in good shape. So let's go ahead and open up this box. By the way, 1991 Tops, for those who are wondering, was Chipper Jones' rookie year. As far as I know, because I haven't searched this box, all 500 of these cards are Chipper Jones in mint condition, but, uh, you know, it's Schrodinger's card, right? So this pattern is the first key way that you can tell if a vending box has been searched or not. Vending box cards were cut directly out of the sheet and slotted in in alternating patterns as the machine went and stuffed the box in packs of, in batches of 500. Um, and so you get this sort of you know ridged pattern of some light stripes and some dark stripes because of the direction that the cutter hit the cards in. Also, uh, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little bit of dust on the cards. That is because these cards were cut from the sheet directly for, before being dropped into the vending box, which meant that all of the cutting dust, all of the last little you know, scraps of card that came off of the blades would drop into the box along with them. Uh, and so, uh, so I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt or beyond a shadow of a doubt that this vending box of 1991 Topps Baseball has never been searched. Now, there's only 500 cards in this box, and it's worth pointing out that 1991 Topps had a series of almost 800 cards. So, uh, you know, you're not going to get a whole set out of one vending box. Usually two boxes would probably be enough to set, get yourself a set, sometimes three. FLIR, uh, you know, trendsetters that they were in the early 1980s actually did produce a way to get full sets out of vending boxes. FLIR vending boxes, of which I've never managed to buy one, from 1981 to 1985, included a label on the box. It was, say, A, B, C, or D. You bought all four of those sets of boxes, box A, box C, box B, and box D, not necessarily in that order, uh, and collated the cards, you would get three complete sets out of four boxes. They had 660 cards in the set, I think, in each of those years. So, you know, you'd sort of do some mix and match. But yes, you would get four, or you get three guaranteed sets out of four FLIR boxes, provided that you bought all four of the different versions. Uh, Tops made no such guarantee. You could, you could, in fact, statistically speaking, uh, get a whole bunch of, uh, of junk cards and none of the cards you were searching for by buying a whole bunch of vending boxes, right? Because it was, in fact, a fairly random cut uh, as long as it matched with the uh, the printing off of the printing sheets. So uh, this set has, uh, this box has never gone, been gone through. I'm not sure if I will. Like I said, I'd like to pretend that it's 500 Chipper Jones rookie cards in there and they're all in mint condition. Uh, and until I open them, uh, well, that's what they're that's what they're going to be. But uh, vending boxes, really cool way to get into the hobby. Really cool way to get into, especially the junk wax era of the hobby. Although theoretically, you could buy 1957 Topps baseball uh, uh, vending boxes, and you know you'd find it then. Uh, but 
you know, still, nonetheless, pretty cool. Uh, very easy to find from Junk Wax Era, super cheap. I paid 20 bucks for this, including shipping, uh, which is a lot cheaper, frankly, than buying individual packs would be for that same era. So, hey, you know, uh, it's another way to enjoy the hunt uh, and enjoy the search for uh, for whatever cards it is you're looking for, or just an, a fun way to get into a particular year's worth of sets. So, there you go. Now you've learned a little bit more about vending boxes. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.